Well, good evening and welcome to our service this evening. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church in Perth. As you can see, we're back in our hut and we were able to meet this morning physically um, and, and worship the Lord in our building for the first time since lockdown, which was wonderful. It was a great blessing and um, we had a, a, a very blessed time. It was unusual. Um, the no singing element of the service was very unusual and quite hard to get used to and, um, and not being able to speak to each other not be able to shake hands or hug someone again very difficult and very unusual especially in a church um, but it was a blessing to be able to to meet together uh, as a congregation and worship our Lord in that way um, in the Sunday evenings we, we intend over the next few weeks still to be in the hut but at some point we will transfer back uh, into our building on a Sunday evening uh, we still intend to continue to uh, record the services and put them up on our Facebook and YouTube uh, channels. So if you want to keep in touch, that's the way to do it uh, through Facebook and YouTube. So it was an encouraging time this morning. Uh, we have a few announcements. <clears throat> uh, on Wednesday evening, the ladies continue uh, with their um, virtual cafe book club uh, at 7 o'clock. And that will continue over Zoom. That's going to be continuing over Zoom. 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening. Thursday evening is our uh, Bible study and prayer meeting. Now, the time has changed. It will be at half past seven. Half past seven on Thursday evening. And it will be at our home in Bridge of Vern. Now, if you want to come, um, certainly contact me or Mike the Deacon. And um, we will be able to give you the co contact details and information about joining with us on Thursday evening for our, our Bible study and prayer meeting at seven o'clock on Thursday. Uh, next Lord's Day, again, we intend to be meeting uh, Sunday morning at the Glen Eagles uh, Day Opportunity Centre in the Glen Eagles Road in Perth. Again, if you can come, that would be fantastic. It'd be lovely to see you. But if you do intend to come, uh, could you let us know? Um, we were able to um, sort the seats out very well this morning because we knew who was coming and even the visitors, we knew the visitors were coming. Um, so that made life an awful lot easier for us. So if you do intend to come to visit us, to, to pop your head in, in through the door as it were, um, let us know so we'll be able to be prepared for you and you'll be able to worship the Lord uh, safely uh, with us next Sunday. Next Sunday evening again we will continue in the hut in this, this format. Uh, with our Facebook and YouTube service on Sunday evening. But we do thank the Lord that we were able to, to meet together and there seems to be some kind of light at the end of the tunnel at this particular moment in time. And we do pray that that light will get bigger and bigger and um, that we won't go back into a lockdown situation, uh, that people will be sensible uh, and um, we will be able to see the end of this in the very near future. Things will take a while, we understand that. Uh, but uh, we just do thank the Lord that we were able to meet together to praise and to worship him uh, this morning. So let us come before the Lord and give him praise and thanks for that, um, that wonderful opportunity that we've had today to worship him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just give you praise and we give you thanks. We give you all the glory. You're a great and wonderful God. You're a faithful God. A loving God. And we thank you for that, Lord. We see that each and every day in our own lives. We thank you for today. We thank you how faithful you've been for us today. As we met this morning as a congregation physically for the first time in such a long time. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we were able to do that. That we heard prayer. We heard your word spoken. We heard your, your word explained. We heard song. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that we were able to join in with all those things and praise and worship you. Heavenly Father, it was slightly stranger than we're normally used to, but yet it was great to be in the house where we worship you. And Heavenly Father, we would ask that even when we're outside of that place, we still continue to worship you. We just don't stop when we leave that, those front doors, Lord. We want to continually worship and praise you. In each and every day that we live. Because Lord we have so much to praise and thank you for. So many people look at this pandemic. And, and, and in certain ways Lord it is terrible. People are losing their lives. But Heavenly Father so many of us have got so much to be thankful for. The very breath that we take is down to you. 
And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the opportunities you give us each and every day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those blessings that you rain down on us each and every day. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being our Heavenly Father, our God. And Lord, we thank you for sending your Son. Heavenly Father, without that sacrifice on the cross, Lord, we would all just be heading to hell. And we would be deserving of that. But Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ and that sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice and that blood. And Heavenly Father, we are thankful every day for that. And Lord, as we come round your word again this evening, we thank you for your help this morning. But again, we would ask, Lord, that your spirit would be here, even in this hut. Heavenly Father, to help me speak clearly, and, uh, uh, you know, and Heavenly Father, with power, not my power, but with the power of the Spirit of God. And Heavenly Father, we pray that whoever's listening, wherever they're listening, your spirit again will just be indwelling there. And Heavenly Father, you would help them to be good listeners for this evening. Lord, we just thank you for all the churches that have been able to open up again. Those have been opened up for three or four weeks, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for that witness. And Heavenly Father, we, we pray for those churches who haven't quite got, got there yet. Lord, we would just pray that you'll help them to be able to open very soon. That again, their congregation, the brothers and sisters in the Lord, will be able to meet together and to worship you, worship our God. So again, Heavenly Father, just thank you for today. And Lord, we just, we just do pray that you will continue to be with us and help, help each and every one of us this evening. And we ask these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to have our scripture reading uh, this evening. And again, uh, we're going to ask Lynn if she will come and read the scriptures to it. It's Joshua, same as last week, Joshua chapter 2. And we'll take time to read the whole chapter. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 24. Thank you, Lynn. Our scripture reading is from Joshua chapter 2 verses 1 through to 24. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you, for the Lord, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives up the land, 
we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterwards you may go your way. The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours, that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun. And they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands. And also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Thank you, Lynn. Now, over the, the last number of weeks, as we have studied the book of Joshua, we have seen the commission of Joshua, how God had called him to lead the nation and how he was equipped by God to do that, to lead the nation into the promised land. Now, we also seen that if Joshua lived a faithful and obedient life, if he was obedient to the word of God, if he was obedient to the commands that God had given him, he would be successful in all that he did. He would be strong. He would be courageous. Whatever, whatever lay in front of him, he would be strong and courageous. And last week we looked at the spies. Uh, the, the spies that Joshua himself sent out, told to go and find out the lay of the land, but especially Jericho. Look at Jericho. Because this would be the first city that they would have to defeat. Tactically, it was an important city. But also, you know, Jericho was a wicked city. A city that loved its sin. It took pride, actually, in its sin. And the question that was hanging over Jericho at that time, because of their sin, all because of their sin, was not if, but when. When the city would be destroyed. But before we come to that, we are introduced to Rahab the harlot. And we see in her story a wonderful story. A, a story of the sovereign power of God in salvation. And it's a wonderful example of God's grace to man. And this evening we're going to look at Rahab. And we're just going to have two points this evening. And that's Rahab's forsaking and Rahab's confession and conversion. So Rahab's forsaking and Rahab's confession and conversion. So the forsaking. As we read the first seven verses of chapter 2, what we see is Rahab forsakes her former life. She begins to do that. She turns her back on it. And I believe scripture gives us evidence for this. The two spies who, who were sent, uh, their cover is broken very quickly. And the king of Jericho sends his messengers and they arrive at Rahab's house. And they tell Rahab, listen, bring out these men. Men who they said had actually entered her house. And they say they've, they've come, they've, they're in your house, they've, they've come to spy on the land, to search out the land. They're enemies of Jericho. They're enemies of the king. So therefore, Rahab, they're enemies of you. So give us these men. But Rahab must have known that these king's men were coming to interrogate her. 
because they're at the door. They've knocked the door and they're there speaking to her. But she's already hidden the spies. They're already gone. I suppose maybe in her former possession or profession, she would have known many low life and high places. So maybe she had informants in the king's palace. We do not know. Maybe they told her, listen, Rahab, if there's anything you need to hide, if there's anything you need to get rid of, for goodness sake, do it now. Because these king's men are coming and they're coming to confront you. And here we can see the beginning of her allegiances and her alliances changing. Once there would have been no doubt that she would have aligned, aligned herself to the king. And the Canaanite way of life. There's no doubt she would have done that. But even in these few short verses, we can see how she's beginning to change. And the first evidence of that is, actually, this divides many Christians. Because Rahab lies here. She tells these men, the king's men, oh yes, those men. Oh, yeah, they were here. Yes, yeah, they, they did come in, yes. But they're gone. They've long gone. I've no idea where they went to, but I know, just know they've left. It was night. They left at night. The gate of the city was about to close and then they fled the city. And then she compounds the lie by telling the kingsmen, you know what, if you hurry, you'll be able to find them. You'll be able to overtake them and capture them and bring them back to the king. And that is exactly what they did. Now, I would suggest in her former profession, again, lying would probably come quite easy to her. Maybe she had to lie to save the, the reputation of the grand and the good of Jericho. So it wouldn't affect her business. So I'm sure she had to lie on, on numerous occasions. And that is one sign of an unregenerate heart. It, it finds it easy to lie. It is so easy for the unregenerate heart to lie. And as I said, this, this point divides many Christians. Some will say, no matter what the situation that Rahab found herself in, no matter what, she should never have done that. She should never have, uh, have lied. There is no excuse for lying. And again, on the other side of that coin, there are people who will accept what she did. Telling us that our motives were true. The situation that she found herself in, this was the right thing to do. This was the only thing to do because she saved lives. She saved the lives of the spies, the two spies, and also she saves the lives of her family. So this was the right thing to do in that situation. Listen, if someone comes into your home and threatens your family, and your family were hiding, and these home invaders said to you, where is your family? What would you do? Really, what, what would you do, really? You would lie. You would say, I don't know where they are. They're gone. Would that be wrong? I believe many of us, if we found ourselves in that situation, similar to what Rahab found herself in, we would act in a similar way. So here's a question. Why do we expect as Christians, especially as Christians, why do we expect the unregenerate heart not to lie? For the unsaved not to lie. Why do we expect the unsaved to behave like the saved? I think scripture at this point makes it clear that Rahab is not a follower of the one true God at this point. She's still unregenerate. But also just think for a moment who Rahab is actually lying to. Yes, it's the king's men at her door. That's who she's talking to. We know that. We understand that. But this information is going to get back to the king. These men will report back to the king. And, and this is who she's actually lying to. She's actually lying to. To the king and this is treason this is punishable by death she lied to the king she's turning she's beginning to turn her life or turning her back on her former life and also on the canaanite way 
I would suggest something to you here, that this was very courageous on her part. Turning from the evil and the corruption of the Canaanites within the city walls of Jericho and courageous to turn her back on this corrupt king and look for and to begin to identify with the God of Israel. That's what she's beginning to do here. She's turning her back on her way of life, on, on the Canaanite way of life. She's turning her back on this corrupt king and the way of, of Jericho. And she's looking to, to, to search for and begin to identify with the God of Israel. Now, we know as a Christian, lying is wrong. Even in this world, this fallen world, most people, not, not all, but most people understand that when you lie, the trust between the, the, the people will break down. The trust with, between you and that person you've lied to will break down. Can you ever believe another word that person has said to you if they've lied to you? And we see that in all walks of life today. We see it with the politicians. We see it with those who are in authority. Sometimes we see it with uh, workmates or even sometimes we see it in our families. When families lie to you. And here Rahab, she does what she feels is right in the situation that she finds herself in. And remember, she's an unregenerate woman at this point. So she's saving the lives of her family. So she lies. Can you really cast the first stone here? I believe with our backs up against the wall, we would do the same thing. But again, I say it doesn't mean it's right to lie. If we were to delve into scripture and study it, we would see other examples, examples similar to Rahab's story. The most famous maybe would be, um, maybe not saying the most famous is the best thing, but the one we know so well is in the book of Exodus, when the Egyptians are afraid of the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. And they're ruthless, they're wicked and they're cruel towards the slaves. And they make their working conditions unbearable. They, they make their lives bitter. And Pharaoh, who did not know the God of Joseph, wanted to kill the newborn sons you know the story and he gave the order to the midwives just to do that kill the newborn sons seek out them and get rid of them and we read that the midwives feared god more than pharaoh that's applicable for today isn't it they feared god more than they feared pharaoh and they deceived pharaoh in exodus 1 and verse 17 it says this but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? Now here's a liar deception. Verse 19. The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are very vigorous. And give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with the midwives. And the people multiplied. And grew very strong. Now the example of the midwives or Rahab. Again as I keep saying. It does not mean it's okay to lie. It doesn't. Scripture tells us in 1 John 3 in verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning. Also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness or as it says in the King James Version sin is a transgression of the law lying is a transgression of the law that's sin and sin is an active breach of God's law deliberately walking over and rejecting those laws rebelling against God and your creator and 1 John goes on even further in chapter 5 and it tells us that the one who is saved will have victory over sin. Now that does not mean we will have an active and sinless perfect life here on earth. You know, each and every one of us, each and every day, struggle with sin. But as a Christian, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we are able to put away that sin. And strive each day to be more like our Saviour, to be more like Christ. This is wonderful news. Sin can be forgiven. That's wonderful news. 
God has made a way for your sin to be forgiven. And we'll see that later on in the story of Rahab. But also look at other evidence of Rahab turning her back on her former life. I believe this is found in verse 6. Now look at verse 6 with me. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on her roof. Now the flax that was on the roof of Rahab's house would have been used to make yarn. It would have been there to make linen cloth. We see references to this in the book of Proverbs. We see it also in the book of Isaiah. So it was used to make garments and robes. That was after the, the crop had been harvested and it was stacked usually on high, on, on high rooftops and flat rooftops in the city in order so it could dry out and be used in the production of those clothes. I believe this is her work now. She had left her former profession and now this is what she was making her living from. Why else would it be necessary for her to do this? If she was still making an income from being a harlot, from being a prostitute, she would not need to have this, this flax on her roof. She now has a new and honest profession, leaving her former life behind. She's forsaken it. Her life is changing here. She's beginning to identify with the people of God and their God. She's left her former life behind her. She's beginning to do that. Next we see her confession and conversion. Look at verse 8 with me. Verse 8 of chapter 2. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. Verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when, when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sion and Og whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God is, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Rahab believed the testimony about God. Somehow the word of what God had done for the nation of Israel had filtered through to Jericho and to the Canaanites. And Rahab, as she heard this, she believed. She believed what she heard. So as soon as the king's men have left her front door, she goes up to the roof to seek out these men that she had hidden. And she stands before these men and she gives them important information. That verse 11 is important information. And these spies can bring that information back to Joshua. She declares her conviction that God is the one true living God. That he had given and promised the land to the nation of Israel. She believed this. And that the victory over Jericho was assured. Over the land was assured. And this was assured because the inhabitants, their hearts had melted. There was fear within them because of the God of Israel. She had heard how the, the Lord had delivered the nation out of slavery. How the Lord had dried up the Red Sea. How the Lord had given them victory over the kings of the Amorites. What the spies would have taken from that was, quite simply, that the inhabitants were defeated already. They were defeated already. Joshua and his army hadn't even stepped foot in the promised land yet. But the people of Jericho were defeated already because they had heard how mighty, how awesome the God of Israel was. And how he was a God of promise and how he kept his promise to his people. Now, with these words we have in front of us, we can see that Rahab, she confesses that the Lord was a sovereign God. The only true and living God. He was in control of all things. He ruled heaven. He ruled earth. And he uses, a, she uses the phrase, your God. 
your God. So she understands that Yahweh is a personal God. A God who looks after his followers, who cares for them. Listen, the Canaanites worshipped many gods and many idols. There was a God of the sea, a God of the moon, a God of the sun. There was a God for healing. There was a God of orchards. There was a God of death, of dance, marriage, fortune, fertility. You name it, they had a God for it. I counted over 50 as I, I was as I was reading about the Canaanites. But here Rahab is standing in front of these spies and she is confessing that these gods are nothing. These idols are nothing. But Yahweh, the Lord, he is a true one. He is a true and living God. She believed all that she heard. And she confesses with her mouth. Today, Believing about God and, and, and believing about his son is essential. It's essential. In, in John chapter 5 and 24, it says these words. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but it has passed from death to life. We need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And we see from verse 12 onwards that Rahab looks to have her, her family and herself saved from death. She knows that the, the army of Israel is about to attack. She knows that they're going to have certain victory. She knows, doesn't know how it's going to come about, but she knows she's heard about the, the God of Israel and what he's done for them. And she knows that he's coming with them as they will attack um, Jericho. So she knows that Jericho is about to fall. And she wants her family and herself to be saved. And she knows that she needs to be saved from death. And again, this is a wonderful picture of Rahab crying out to the Lord for salvation. It's a picture of that. And this is what scripture tells us in the book of Romans. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is a picture of what Rahab's doing here. Her crying here is a crying from the heart. She's crying out to God, help us, rescue us, deliver me, deliver my family. She knew that the God of Israel would give them victory. She knew that. It was assured. She had heard, as I said, heard evidence of this happening before. And she knows the same thing is going to happen in Jericho. If the God of Israel can deliver Jericho into the hands and the land into the hands of Israel, then the God of Israel can save her and her family. And there's an oath pledged to each other here. And it wasn't just before each other, this was before God as well. And the spies here are basically saying, if Rahab, Rahab, if you keep your end of the bargain, if you don't betray us, if you don't let anything slip, if you don't tell anybody what's going to happen, then you and all your household will be saved. But if she was to betray them, if she was to lay a trap for them, then they would be free from that oath before her and before God. And her fate would be the same as the rest of Jericho. And that would be death. And what happens here next is action. There's action. She just doesn't go back to her house and sit and wait. Obviously, she does that later on when the spies have gone. She has to do that. She just has to stay in the house. But... She helps the spies. She helps them flee the city. There's action here. She helps them flee the city. Tells them where to hide in the mountains outside of the city. And how long to hide there for. You know, for you this evening to be saved, you must call upon the Lord. Because it is only he that can save you. You cannot save yourself. And Rahab understood that. She also knew that her false gods, those deities made by the hands of men, were useless at this time. They were lifeless stones and lifeless pieces of metal. She could no longer put her trust in those idols and deities to save her. She knew they were incapable of doing that. Because that's all they were, stone and metal. But she cries to the Lord. And that's what you must have to do. That's what you have to do. To be saved. Don't look to your idols to save you. Whatever they may be. Because they cannot save you. 
You need to believe in the evidence that is written in Scripture of who Christ is, why he came to this earth, why he died, why he rose from the dead again. And if you turn from your sin and cry to a merciful God, because that's exactly what he is. He is a merciful God. He will be faithful to save you. And again, in the book of Acts, in Scripture again, Acts 2, 21, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. At this part in the scripture, Rahab is given conditions. And these are conditions that she has to adhere to and her family have to adhere to if they are to be saved. There had to be a scarlet thread or a scarlet rope hung outside her window in the city wall. So it would identify her house. So this was a way to tell the army, the invading army, that this house was a house of safety now. Pass it by. Leave the occupants alone. They are safe. So these occupants would not feel the wrath and the destruction that was being meted out to the other inhabitants of Jericho at this time. Rahab and her family would not be touched. And we looked at that briefly last week. How there was a connection between the blood on the doorposts or the, of the homes of the Israelites in Egypt. The blood of the Passover lamb. Something similar. But I also want you to see something that that her and her family needed to stay in the house. They could not leave for any reason. They could not budge. They had to stay. It was lockdown. They could not go leave their house. They couldn't go back to their own home and pick up something that they'd left. They couldn't maybe go back to their own house and pick up, pick up a wee favourite trinket or whatever it was. If they left their house of safety... And they walked in the streets of Jericho again. And the, the invading army were there. Then they would meet their end. Their bloody end. Listen. Once you're saved. The devil will attack you. He won't give up. He will tell you. Go back into the world. You've left that favourite trinket of yours. Go back there. That's the thing you loved. Why have you left it there? Go back into the world and get it. Now that. Trinket could be your friends that you miss. Those people you run around with on a, on a weekend. Or it could be a pursuit that you did before you became a Christian. Something that takes you away from God. And this could be a pursuit that you live for. Something that you live for. And the devil uses these things. These wee trinkets to try and bring you back into the world. He will say, go back. Go, go back into the world. It won't matter. No one's watching you. It won't harm you. There will be no harm done to you or anybody else. But we know that's a lie. Once you're saved, you do not return to that world. We don't look to the world. We don't look to the world and think we're missing all that sin. No. No, we look to our Saviour. The one who has made our eternity sure. <laughs> where our hope is. Where our joy lies. Not in the sinful ways of this world. Yes we will be tempted as we're saved. To go back into the world. But we have to focus upon Christ our Saviour. As I said our eternity is sure because of him. Our hope is in him. Our joy lies in him. You know Rahab and her family needed to be separate from Jericho. We need to be separate from the world outside. One commentator puts it like this and I quote. Excuse me. We must repent and separate from the world, from its sinful, evil, and wicked ways. We must live lives of spiritual separation, turning away from the world and turning totally to follow God. Spiritual separation simply means that we turn away from the world and its sinful ways to follow God and His holy and righteous ways. Spiritual separation means to live holy and righteous lives, not sinful and wicked lives. End quote. Rahab and her family needed to be separated. Today we need to be separated from a wicked and sinful world. Then we see Rahab and her family. They did exactly what they were asked to do. She did these things. and These, these actions saved her. These works saved her. 
the hanging of the thread outside her window, the staying inside of her house, the fact that she did not gossip or betray the spies. These are the things that saved her, these works. But here's the thing. Now listen to me here. Here's the thing. She was saved. Her family was saved because she believed in the Lord. She had faith that what he said would happen would indeed happen. She confessed him as Lord. These actions came after. These actions came after this. These actions, these things that she did were a result of her faith in Yahweh. She had a faith in Yahweh, so she did what she was asked to do. She, she, she put out the scarlet thread out of her window. She got her family inside the house and they stayed inside the house. They didn't tell anyone of the plans of the spies. But she did that because of her faith in God. So in conclusion, as I said at the beginning, this portion of scripture shows us a sovereign God. How he, can, he is in control of all things. And he can, he can do this. He's in control of all things because all things were made by him. He is sovereign in the capture of Jericho and the land. Verse 14 says, And it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Spies talking to Rahab. Verse 24, And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands. God was sovereign in delivering Jericho and the land to Israel. These promises of God were about to be proven true. And only a sovereign God could keep these promises. As I said last week, the spies report repeated what Rahab herself had said in verse 9. I know that the Lord has given you the land. And only a sovereign God could do that. Do you believe in a sovereign God? One who is in control of everything. Absolutely every aspect of this world. Every aspect of your life. I pray you do. And if you don't, then my, I would suggest to you that your problem isn't a, a problem with sovereignty. I, I believe your problem is with God himself. Who he is and what he says he is. Also, we see God being sovereign in salvation. It is all of God. And with Rahab, she was saved. She was chosen before time. She, she's chosen to be in the lineage of Christ himself. Again, last week, we looked at that at Matthew verse, or chapter 1, verse 5, or verse 5 and onwards. And that lineage tells us that there were harlots in it. There were adulterers in it. There were liars, heroes, Gentiles and, and, and Jews. And this tells us a wonderful truth. That Christ is for all. If you're listening to this recording or if you're if, if you're watching me tonight, this isn't a coincidence that you're listening. This isn't, this isn't chance or it isn't luck that you're listening to this. God has brought you to this point. You're here to hear the gospel of Christ. No matter who you are or where you're from, no matter what you've done or what you haven't done. It doesn't matter who you are. Christ is for all. Christ came to this earth to die on a cross for you to bear your sins. Sins that you deserve to be punished for. He took those sins upon himself. He bore that punishment upon himself. Now I believe this evening the Spirit of God will do one of two things. I've said this before. He will either convict you of your sin, show you that you need Christ... Show you that you need to turn from your sin and put off the old and put on the new. The Spirit of God, that's the Spirit of God's job. We looked at that this morning in the book of Acts. Or the Holy Spirit will do another thing. Again, we looked at this in, this morning. The Holy Spirit may well begin to harden your heart. Just like he did Pharaoh. Listen, the Spirit of God gives life. And the Spirit of God can take life. And since the beginning in Genesis, we have to be, we've been called to repentance and, and righteousness. We've been called 
to follow Christ. And again, I just want to go back to that point. Christ is for all. It doesn't matter if you're black or you're white. I know that's an issue at the moment. But Christ is for the black man. Christ is for the white man. He's for the Asian. He's for all mankind. Christ is for the poor man. He's for the rich man. He's for the old. He's for the young. Again, as I said, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter what you've, you, you haven't done in the past. Christ died and shed his precious blood for you, for me. And just like Rahab, I would pray that you would forsake your former life, your sinful life, and again just be like Rahab and turn to Christ, confess Christ, call to Christ and repent of your sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive your sins. And all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We pray that as you this evening. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we just thank you how we can see the story of Rahab, a life that was full of sin. But yet, Heavenly Father, she, she heard of the God of Israel and she realised that he was the one and true living God. That those idols that they'd been worshipping for so many years were nothing made by man, made of stone, made of metal, made of wood. And Heavenly Father, they could do nothing for her. She turned and cried aloud unto the, the God of, of Israel. And Heavenly Father, we would just pray that there may be some this evening who would be like Rahab and cry unto the Lord, who would turn from their former lives, their former sins, and Heavenly Father, cry unto the Lord to be saved. And Heavenly Father, we just pray that the Spirit of God, as we looked at this morning, Lord, that the Spirit of God will do his work and convict the sinner of their sin. Heavenly Father, it's all of God. It's all of you. Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you for your, your presence with us today. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with us again this evening. Again, we're going to finish off with a, an item of song. I think it's one we've used before. Um, it was one we were going to use this morning at our, our meeting in, in, in Perth, but we decided not to. And it is Behold Our God. Or Behold Our God. And it's from Grace Community Church again in Sun Valley in the USA. And uh, we just pray that the Lord will bless you through this song. Um, and uh, that you again you will maybe join with us next week if you can but if you can't we just pray that the Lord will bless you this week and again just thank you for joining with us Amen <laughs>